Now it is my honor to uh, introduce Sarah Lewenson to introduce our main program. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, President Tom. So on your way in, as Chris told you earlier, I'm sure you saw the table recruiting you to join the Sustainability Committee. Uh, my fellow committee members and I are working to bring the concepts of climate sustainability to Seattle Floor Rotary. But until recently, I would not have imagined that we need to consider cows as part of that discussion. Dennis Hayes and his wife, Gail, who's also with us today, um, have recently published a remarkable text linking the history of human and bovine development chronicling the centuries-old beneficial relationship between humans and cattle that has evolved into one that now endangers us. So Dennis Hayes needs little introduction to us at Seattle 4. He's been, it's kind of an understatement to say he's been a leading uh, member of Seattle's Sustainability Committee for many years, from being the national coordinator of the first Earth Day in 1970, to today um, in his leadership of the Bullet Foundation, overseeing development of the world's most sustainable office building right here in Seattle. Dennis has made a difference in all of our lives with results that may or may not be obvious to us, but now, obvious to us now, but will stretch many years into the future. And I'd also like to recognize Dennis's co-author and spouse, Gail Boyer Hayes, who's a retired lawyer and lifelong writer and editor, and she is a leader in the sustainability community, community in her own right. She wrote Solar Access Law, Protecting Access to Sunlight and Solar Energy Systems, and with that helped launch a whole new field of law. The two of you make a formidable team. Together, you've written a compelling and eloquent book that defines a little recognized challenge and inspires us to look at better ways for people and cattle to coexist. And to quote one review of the book, imagine an evening of conversation with the smartest, wittiest, most charming and interesting couple you know. We're privileged to listen in to part of that conversation today. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians, please join me in welcoming Dennis Hayes. Thank you very, very much, Sarah. Uh, if it's the most charming, wittiest couple that you know, uh, that's because one member of the team is carrying more than her share of the load. Uh, and, and it's often true when you have the co-authorship of a book that one person is smarter, one person is funnier, one person is more graceful, one person's better looking. Uh, than the other, uh, and you got the other today. <laughs> um, the only reason that I'm up here and Gail isn't is that she looks at the prospect of public speaking very much like I look at the prospect of colonoscopies. Uh, <laughs> but she will join me at the end, assuming that I race through all of these slides rapidly enough to answer some of the questions. It is, I should say, always a thrill to come to Seattle for. Uh, I, I'm not at all surprised by the French horns, a little surprised by the bagpipes, and delighted to find how many people are here with backgrounds in the uh, raising of Angus beef cattle and, and from the dairy industry. Washington has a fairly long history of being involved with these things. You'll see there that the carnation was the first, this is way back in 1909, to have milk from contented cows. And it turns out recent research suggests that milk from contented cows is not only somewhat more voluminous, but more healthy. We see a lot of cows on containers for various kinds of things. We see cows every place. This is, um, I should say this did not come from Nordstrom. Uh, th this is a t-shirt that I purchased for my wife. I thought that it was quite stylish. Uh, she has worn it one time uh, to, to bed one night. This is something that I don't think anybody thinks of as being particularly classy, except my sister, who is a cheesehead from Wisconsin and sent it to us when she knew that we were working on a book on cows. This is my granddaughter, dressed up last Halloween as, of course, a cow. Cows, we believe, are the second most important animal in America, second only to humans. That will be a surprise to many, but it's hard if you think about it. Uh, cows' impact on the economy, their impact on politics, their impact on our culture, 
Their impact on the environment and their impact on human health absolutely dwarf horses or dogs or cats or the, anything that you can think of. Cows are far more important, far more taken for granted and seldom thought of. They played a role of pulling covered wagons across and once they reached their destination, the oxen were unhooked and they began to plow the fields and to provide milk. Paul Bunyan, roaming through Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan, had Babe the Blue Ox as his constant companion. This is what Babe the Blue Ox actually looked like in not mythology. But one of the things, because cows, unlike horses who hold their heads high, cows have their heads down, they can pull far greater loads. And so they are always pulling these gigantic things with uh, steers or cows or uh, basically oxen. Cattle drives out of the Old West, which have come to be so important in our literature and in our movie scene. But the cows, every cow in the world descended from this creature, which you can see on early cave paintings. This is an aurochs, uh, A-U-R-O-C-H-S. Uh, we began domesticating aurochses uh, about 10,000 years ago, roughly the same time that we started with horses. This is the skeleton of the last oryx ever. He was killed in Poland in the 1600s. This is a sense of the relative size of an oryx versus a contemporary bull. Um, they were big, they were fierce, they were mean, they were smart. Uh, they terrified people. They fought gladiators in the Colosseum. Uh, Julius Caesar wrote things about how fearful he was that his troops would encounter a bunch of oryxes on one of their expeditions. It's, this is sort of a modern equivalent of that. Uh, that's to say, somebody thousands and thousands of years ago, first got the idea of milking an oryx. Um, his, his name is not known to us. I'm reasonably confident he did not survive to have children. <laughs> but this is a, a somewhat more recent thing. I, putting, putting your cart behind a couple of yoked buffalo has to be a, a perfect candidate for the Darwin Award. <laughs> Humans are the only mammals, other than pussycats, uh, that, that drink the milk of a different species. This is, of course, the sort of things that cows have historically done for us. It's the sort of reason that we began domesticating them. They were pulling plows through fields, they were pulling heavy loads, and they were uh, turning mills to grind up grain, functions that are no longer being performed by cows, except in, in particular unique niche things like uh, oxen felled timbering today. We developed 800 breeds of cows. Some of them, like that one from Siberia, were designed to withstand intense cold. This one was even more intense cold. And this is hot desert heat. And this is moist uh, Indian heat. And then this is your standard jersey. And you go on through the array of cows that serve a variety of different functions in different environments. I have no idea what they designed this one to do. <laughs> This is, I think, sort of pretty, and this one is just adorable. Uh, there is, of course, the Arnold Schwarzenegger cow, the, the one that hangs out in the gym all day long. I'm not absolutely confident we needed a Donald Trump cow. And this is Big Bertha, not the Big Bertha that you already know about here in the Seattle Rotary that is down drilling a hole through our city but rather a cow that lived to be nearly 50 years old in Ireland. Uh, cows that give milk are freshened by having calves. Big Bertha holds the Guinness record. She had 39 calves over her life. Um, and as she got into her elder years and he used to take her uh, to a, a number of public showings, she was also one who did not appreciate speaking or showing in public. And he used to feed her a, a pint of Irish whiskey with great regularity, which those of us of Irish extraction are confident contributed to her long life. I, I, I will say as one who was raised an Irish Catholic that even in Ireland, 39 is a whole lot of kids. <laughs> ah, you know, this is something that I can't really read from here. So I'm gonna get a little closer to this. Well, I can't get closer to the screen. Can I borrow that hand mic? Oh, wait a second. I've got it right in front of me. Rotary, I'm so proud of you. You're on top of this stuff. Okay, so this is a, a, a chart. I don't know if most of you have younger eyes than I do, and you can see this chart, but those of you who are close to the screen at least. These are a couple of curves that show what's happened to dairy farms and to milk productivity per cow. 
Dairy farms have gone down spectacularly, way over 90%. They've gotten vastly bigger, but the numbers of them have declined dramatically. The amount of milk produced per cow has similarly gone up fairly substantially. This is what's happened to the number of uh, dairy cows per, and then the amount of milk output per cow. You'll find that the dairy cows have gone down too, but that's because the cows have been bred to deliver more milk per cow. Uh, you see here, sometimes this gets to the level where uh, the uh, cow delivering mechanisms are, are getting fairly substantial and in fact so substantial that people are now putting brassiers on some cows. Uh, glancing at this crowd and seeing many hairlines that resemble my own, which implies that you too probably spent a few hours in your youth thumbing through Sears Roebuck catalogs, don't get too excited by the brassiere up here. <laughs> this is a, a dairy farmer down in Oregon that we visited. Uh, and this is his uh, insect control process. He has a variety of different kinds of birdhouses that appeal to different birds and uh, uses no pesticides, but as we walked around his farm for more than eight hours, uh, encountered effectively no insects at all. That's that same farmer, one of his cows is giving birth. If you're close enough, you can see the little calf there, the cow is eating the placenta. Uh, and these are the vultures that are hoping that the calf will not survive or that the cow will abandon the placenta, but they are a constant present in the balance of nature as well. This is actually the farmer. Um, who's tending to repair a, an electric fence here. He uses rotational intensive grazing. Uh, but he knows everything. I mean, this is, this is what we learned in the book. It, it, the degree of knowledgeability of the best farmers in America is simply staggering. He knows every grass, every tree, every shrub, every forb, every insect, every bird. He, he, he knows his land with a completeness that is, is truly astonishing. He, he, he is for his acreage, the equivalent of a world-class astrophysicist studying uh, the universe. And it was just common. This is his herd coming in. It's another picture of them, adorable cows. This is something that really surprised me. This is a robot dairy, and I'll confess, intuitively, it didn't appeal to me. Uh, but it turns out it really appeals to cows. Um, which may say something for the skill of milkers, I, I don't know, but, but given their choice, they will do this. It's, it's a simple mechanism where uh, the cow is enticed into a chute with a little bit of grain, um, and then they go down to the chute, a laser finds where the teats are, attaches the devices. As it comes out, the monitor tells you how much milk comes out of each individual teat, uh, what its uh, uh, butter fat content is, uh, what its pH is, whether there's any indicators of any diseases, what the volume is. I mean, it's, it's a wealth of data that allows the farmer to be absolutely on top of everything. And in this case, a farmer who's, whose children didn't relish the idea of 16-hour days, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it allows him to keep his farm going in, in his hands until he finds someone from the next generation who will want to take it over. Um, this is another interesting technological innovation. What do you do with the poop? Pretty hard to handle with the big confined animal feeding operations, but with small dairy farms, uh, you can collect it, put it into an underground anaerobic digester, produce some methane, use the methane to generate electricity and sell it as a renewable energy source into the grid. And instead of the methane going up as a global warming gas, it, it becomes something that is contributing to society in a positive way. This is where, for some audiences, uh, the things get just a bit more controversial, particularly at dinners where we have just been served beef before the presentation. Um, whereas with Oryx, it was the survival of the fittest. It's not a gross exaggeration to say that today it is the survival of the fattest. We, we use bovine growth hormone. We use all sorts of antibiotics as fattening agents. We use them prophylactically against disease, but one byproduct is that it also fattens the cow. We use sugar-dense corn, which is kind of the equivalent of high fructose corn syrup. For us, it is something which makes cows obese, and then they make us obese. This is probably something that almost everybody here knows, but I didn't know because I walked into this book quite naive about the whole thing. But the way that we put grades of beef together is the more fat that it contains, uh, uh, pretty much the higher the quality is as you go from select to choice to prime Prime gets up to sometimes over 12% of the intramuscular fat and a lot more marbling. Marbling is a way of sort of, once again, saying fat, visible fat. 
We're not going to have any of the slides here that would be inappropriate for a, a lunch conversation. Uh, there are some pretty barbaric things that you can find on some of the large CAFOs. They, there are activities in some of the videos that have been shot that make me sort of embarrassed to be a human being. Uh, we, we do some terrible things. Um, but this is just what those operations look like. The biggest of them in the beef industry will have more than 100,000 cattle in it. This is Gail visiting uh, the leader of uh, the manager of, of one of the sustainable beef operations that we visited. Uh, one recurrent theory is, 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 as we found both in the dairy and the beef industry, the really superb operators, the ones that are doing everything right, women seem to be playing an increasingly prominent role in it. I hate to be, thank you very much. It's, it was probably no mystery to anyone that it was one of my female friends applauding that one. Um, but it, it, is, it is true, kind of across the board. This is that particular herd. They too use uh, intensive rotational grazing and it's, they, they took a, an area that was, a, a pasture land had been absolutely destroyed and they have over the course of 10 years restored it to something that is really quite lush and on which they are able to uh, raise nene, the highly endangered uh, Hawaiian geese. Uh, it's compatible. In fact, Jay Gordon, the policy director of the Washington Dairy Association has uh, a whole series of things that he's brought into his organic dairy down in central Washington, not central, central Pacific Washington, it's off near Longview, that is um, uh, helping uh, with crops for flyways and what have you. In the background, that little shed, uh, we are not going to go inside it, but that is a, a new thing for these small dairies. One of the big problems, not, excuse me, for the small beef operations, one of their pro problems has been slaughtering. Uh, big slaughterhouses carry an enormous number of cows through, and if you're a small operator, there's just no way to work yourself in with all of these things, the grass finish, the organic. But if, if you have a herd of 250 cows and they are processing 30,000 cows a day, it just doesn't work. So now we've got these mobile units that can actually be taken out to the individual farms and it's helping to create the market for all of those positive things and, and also uh, a, a degree of localism. This is what happens when a cow recognizes that there is a ramp ahead of her that leads to a place she really doesn't want to go and is smart enough to figure out how to get out of it. This is a rock star cow in, in Europe named Ivan. Ivan escaped uh, en route to the slaughterhouse in Germany, scampered out into the woods and disappeared. Okay, we're talking Germany, right? This isn't the Amazonian rainforest. Y Ivan got away and so they were concerned about this wild cow that was out there. Uh, you know, you, you typically are not terribly worried about wild cows. You take Elsie out to the farm gate, slap her on the flank, and say, okay, babe, you're on your own. Very short life expectancy. Elsie turned out to be really pretty cunning. She, uh, with, with helicopter searches, with military sent in to find her, with a breathtakingly handsome bull brought in to roam around the area, uh, Elsie, eluded capture for more than three months. Um, cows are herd animals, and in the end, Elsa, uh, Yvonne got lonely, and she joined a herd, and a farmer recognized her there. But by that time, she had become such a European sensation with nightly news, I haven't found Yvonne yet, that uh, when they captured her, and I should say captured her not without a little bit of resistance, uh, they, they put Yvonne uh, off to pasture. Uh, she is now in a better place. She will live out the rest of her natural life. There's some, well, I need to keep racing. The human-bovine relationship, while mutually beneficial, has never been symmetrical in the area where meat is concerned. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the great losses is Seattle's foremost cartoonist, Gary Larson, who always found a way to put these various things out there. This has been the general attitude of, of cows toward us. And what they actually eat, of course, is corn, and a lot of that is grown in Iowa. Almost all of it is grown in the Midwest. And it is part of a vast complex that has developed over the last several decades of mutually reinforcing things in very large agribusiness corporations where there's a high degree of consolidation. The number of farmers has, has diminished dramatically. A lot of the key decisions are now being made on Wall Street and those of you who saw last week the coverage of the various people, the casino owners and the uh, hedge fund operators and the what have you, that were bringing the Republican candidates in to um, 
uh, give a, a song and dance for them. Uh, one of the biggest was in Iowa, and it was headed by a billionaire corn farmer and a series of his friends. And of course, Iowa is a pretty important state for people who are seeking presidential politics. Um, in fact, looking through the whole thing as we were researching the book, looking at the fates of efforts to amend the farm bill and what have you, we, we pretty much concluded that political uh, efforts in this field, if you were trying to bring about change, just weren't going to work. If there is a piece of leverage, it will not be political, it will be as consumers. This is just a quick slide that shows you that in ways of getting the biological productivity of the planet converted into meat, that beef is, although it has some unique advantages over some other meats, it is the least efficient way of getting there. This is something that shows what we do with all of the corn that we raise and shows the incredible growth of the amount of corn that's being raised in the United States. The worst of it is, is undoubtedly that middle one, the ethanol production, something that makes, what is that phrase, spherically senseless? It makes no sense no matter how you look at it. Um, the blue is, is the corn that is fed to cows, and actually a, a slice of the yellow goes to cows as well as, as distillers dried grain that's left over from the ethanol manufacturing process. And a little bit of the red actually includes exports, and some of that goes to feed cows abroad. Uh, they now consume a, a, essentially 50% of, of all of the corn that's grown. Um, this is another issue that is out there. I'm racing through a bunch of issues on sort of one slide per chapter going through the book, but, but this is antibiotics. And you can look at the amount that is spent on people. Virtually all of that is to treat a particular bacterial disease. There's a little bit of prophylactic antibiotics with some people who've had joint transplants and what have you, but, but by and large that is targeted use. Probably some abuse, uh, particularly among pediatricians. They would rather be safe than sorry, and there's, there's some use that is unnecessary, but not so much in the That higher figure on livestock, much higher figure on livestock, a lot of that has nothing to do with treating disease. It's with avoiding disease with cows that are on uh, big CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, where they're being fed corn. It uh, causes acidosis in their stomachs uh, sometimes, but without getting into all of the details, makes them vulnerable to a wide variety of diseases, and they lace them with antibiotics in order to prevent those diseases from taking hold, as well as one of the funny things that came out is that antibiotics tend to make them fatter. Interestingly, antibiotics tend to make us fatter, too. And of course, that's produced antibiotic resistance. Last year, from antibiotic-resistant bacteria in the United States, we had 23,000 deaths. We had illnesses for roughly the same number of people as the population of Houston. Antibiotic-resistant diseases are kind of scary. This is the pathways that you get from livestock into people. And this is me. I had a case of antibiotic-resistant MRSA. Um, and we went through five antibiotics before we finally found something that could treat it. Uh, it, it is a kind of a terrifying thing when you are given uh, a diagnosis that says, no, that didn't work, no, that didn't work, no, that didn't work. I mean, it, it's, you hope that there's something out there that will still work. And this is, I think, actually, when you get your short list of five or six global threats to be worried about, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, I think, is in that list. We'll not deal here with the global warming stuff. I'm guessing you all know about methane. Um, what a lot of people don't know, you think of it as a tailpipe issue. In fact, it's a belching issue for the most part. Uh, this is what's happened in the United States in terms of obesity. Those are really pretty scary trends if you look at a, a period just from 1990 to 2010. And if you were to overlay a map with regard to diabetes, it would look very much the same. And these are the dietary factors that go into it, many of them having to do with things we've been talking about, both high-fat beef and uh, particularly high-fructose corn syrup. Peak beef in the United States appears to have been 1975. There's a development that's already occurring. People are eating less and less beef and starting from a very, very small base but growing very rapidly healthier, leaner, grass-finished beef as well. Um, okay, next slide. It's long, it's wordy but it's probably the most important slide in the presentation. In 2013, an average American ate 57.5 pounds of beef per year. That's down from 61.6. .6. If we compare that down dramatically to 26 pounds, half a pound a week, and we limit it to the highest, most sustainable beef, which is really where we are pushing for in, in this book. This is not an anti-beef book. This is a limited number of cows raised appropriately. 
Then we can cut pollution, global warming, medical costs, animal cruelty, loss of soil, loss of diversity, and uh, fewer germs that'll be resistant to antibiotics. It's all things that can be done by individuals. If you think about any big social movement that's happened, you know, I, 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 I grew up in a household where it would never have occurred to my mother to ask somebody not to smoke in her living room. That would have been so unthinkably rude that she would have become an outcast. And some people did start asking, and then restaurants started asking, and then it became a social cause. There were some people that refused to uh, be denied permission to eat at certain lunch counters. What did they do? They went in there and sat down and waited to be served. And if they weren't served, they just continued to sit there until either the police came or the business uh, closed for the day. And the same sort of thing in field after field. If people were opposed to the war, they burned their draft cards. And it started with small little activities, one here and there, and then mushroomed into something that became social. We, we, we led the nation here in recycling in Seattle. It began with individuals throwing bags of cans and papers and hauling them in a car, burning a lot of gasoline to an ecology center someplace. Really, really stupid in terms of the energetics of it, but it then created enough demand that we moved to curbside recycling and have one of the two first curbside recycling ordinances in the country. It's individuals making this choice. That's why I was so delighted to get an invitation from Rotary. I mean, you are the people that are likely to lead this kind of movement if, in fact, it's going to begin. And what I'm asking you to do is pay attention to what you eat and eat only those things that are healthy for you uh, and in the amounts that are healthy for you. President Thomas Jefferson argued that meat should not be a course. Meat should be a garnish. We don't go quite that far, but we do want it to be cut back dramatically. And as you get more and more comfortable with it, you can become, like Gail and I are, a source of great embarrassment to their friends when we go to restaurants and we begin to grill the waiter. And, was this beef grass finished or merely grass fed? Was it organic? Where did it come from? How do you know these claims? What kinds of certification is there? And you do that very much as we do with the salmon that was on our plates here, as we do with wines, as we do with coffees, as we do with all of that stuff. We become more discriminating. And as informed consumers, as we multiply virally across the country, I think we can actually make ourselves and our cows' lives much healthier. Thank you very much. I'd like now to introduce the better half, as previously explained, Gail Hayes, and they're going to have some time for Q&A. Take it away. My guys. We have a question here, President Tom, with Mark Weed. Hello, I'm Mark Weed, and uh, I'm a cattle rancher. Uh, we raise uh, Angus, a natural grass-fed beef in Pierce County, on 320 acres of uh, property that my uh, father-in-law purchased in the 50s. Uh, that's a mile by a half mile, <laughs> and it's within uh, 50 miles of here. And uh, I came to this meeting today anticipating something different than what I heard. And our cattle are grass-fed and finished. Hey. Uh, we uh, bring that, uh, those cattle into this market uh, through a mobile slaughter unit that's uh, established in Pierce County. Uh, USDA uh, approved. Our biggest challenge, though, is that it, you won't pay for it. It costs too much. And I would say that uh, the persuasion today is to maybe reconsider your purchasing uh, 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 model and also look behind the curtain, as Dennis has talked. There are folks out there that say they have local natural grass-fed or something meats, and I'll, I'll not stay just with the meats, and some of the big names that go around touting this in this community, ask them where it really comes from. Please. I've got a question over here. You made a very important point. When you buy beef, don't just look for grass-fed. Essentially, all beef is grass-fed for the first part of its life. You want grass-finished. And it's worth paying more and eating less because of the health effects. A little bit of beef is terrific for you. A lot of beef, too much beef, there are things in it, the studies, very good studies of 
One was over 100,000 people uh, over a period of 30 years. They found that people who ate a lot of red meat died sooner of many diseases. That's in the book if you want the citation to that. There's something in red meat, we don't know exactly what it is, other than just that fat, it might be the heme iron or it might be something called carnitine that turns into another chemical that makes cholesterol stick around. But it's worth paying more for better beef. The important thing is thank you very much for doing. What, what you are doing is precisely what it is that we're encouraging everyone to do. Thank you. <laughs> Next question right over here. Um, a few years ago, 60 Minutes has report like in a little town in England, um, the town was people are dying, like a high percentage of the little town. And finally they find out it's a milk come from the cow. The cow was eating the grass, which is fed by pesticide. And that caused the, 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 the grass digest through and get into the milk and the people died of cancer of it. And the other things is uh, and um, the National Institute of Health have showed very clearly result that pesticide caused um, the brain disease because the pesticide pesticide made is to kill the insect and by the nerve system and so when you accumulate enough of those pesticide in your brain and you cause Parkinson and so that's published on NIH website and so if we say we eat the grass feed cows it's not enough because the pesticide can get your brain cause Parkinson, and that's a very devastating disease too. So what you think of to have those people labeled as grass feed also, they need to be organic as well. In addition to all the antibiotics and all the uh, things related to the fat, especially hormones also can cause um, cancers, those kind of things. You're absolutely right. Um, the USDA itself has found 12 pesticides in beef and 10 in dairy, and nearly every one of them has bad health effects in humans. They're in very small amounts, but some of these chemicals are endocrine disruptors. They mimic hormones, and especially for growing children, if they can be exposed even to a tiny amount at just the wrong period in their development, it can cause all sorts of problems with both their brain and their physical development. We have a question here from Jeff. Could can I please? say just one more really quick thing, because this is commonly said out there, and it's important that everyone understand it. Mostly what we've been focused on, what we've been focused on, what America's been focused on is the war on cancer. And the way that you do that, is to test against it for various animals and things, is by increasing the dose to very large levels and then extrapolating back to what would be a smaller level and what the cancer rates would be. With a number of the endocrine disruptors, it's, that just doesn't work. Your body can recognize that if there's a certain level of these synthetic hormones there, that that could not be natural, and it shuts it off, so that you have an effect at a small dosage that you would not have at a high dosage. Counterintuitive, and yet now it's, it's been proven uh, very strongly for a number of the endocrine disruptors. Will you please compare the American beef industry with, say, the Argentinian beef industry and changes between or differences between those? Thanks. Well, we, we should forthrightly say we, we spent a great deal of time looking at cows in America because of the way that they basically shaped America, their enormous impact on this country, and, and essentially none, though I would love to have been able to convince our publisher to send us to Argentina and a few other. Uh, I, I, my impression, and it's a totally uninformed impression, is that a lot of the beef in Argentina uh, does not go through the same fattening process that ours does here. Uh, but I know that, that there are a lot of places in South America where they've been mowing down forests in order to grow uh, corn and, and soybeans. So there's something going on, but we're just fuddling. We, we can't really answer that. Um, yeah. Question uh, right here from Washington Dairy Farmer. Thank you very much. I appreciate your respect perspective on this uh, situation. I'm Leanne Cranick. My husband and I own and operate Cranick Dairy in Enumclaw, Washington. We milk about 1,100 head and farm 950 acres all on the plateau. Um, I do have a question, but let me tell you a little bit more about our farm. 
Over the 102 years our farm has been in operation, as with many farms in the state of Washington, we practice a high degree of sustainability. One of the things we have done is since Seattle is so close to our farm, we get spent grain from breweries up to the tune of three to four million pounds a month that would likely otherwise be sent to a landfill. It still has nutritional value. We bring it back home and feed it to our cows. Now, if people want to argue that happy cows live in California, my herd will beg to differ. Um, our beer in Washington is bar none. Um, on the back end, we take all of our manure, it is composted, and we use it as bedding, and I also sell it as a soil amendment to garden centers all over Washington. To do all these sustainability things takes a lot of money. Um, that There's no doubt about that. We want to try really hard. We practice animal welfare, and we like the environment. We need to take care of what takes care of us. One of the major exports on dairy is powdered milk, and it is shipped to the tune of 330,000 pounds every day to foreign countries, primarily China, and they use it as infant formula. They have figured out something that America hasn't. We have the cheapest food supply in the world, and it is also the safest. If we take your model based on that situation, what is going to be the economic impact to my farm and to my industry? And also, what are you going to tell those people in China when they say we're, you're, that you're no longer going to be able to get a good dairy product that has lots of protein? Um, we compete with New Zealand in that dry milk market. One thing you might not know about that distiller's grain is that when they make that ethanol mash, they have to put an antibiotic in it. Yours doesn't have that. That's wonderful. Well, a lot of it does. <laughs> and uh, it survives the heat process, so then the antibiotics get into the cows. Um, I think it's terrific to try to be sustainable, and it's going to be hard. And uh, they're going to be a lot, of, you know, we have a burgeoning organic dairy business here in Washington. The number of organic dairy farms is growing quite fast, and so are their exports to China and elsewhere. And it's much harder when you have a thousand cows. I appreciate that, and I, I can't answer the cost thing. No, the, 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 very good. I mean, these, these are all the kinds of practical things that we ran into in ranch after ranch and farm after farm. They're, you have to make a bottom line or this thing isn't going to work. What we're trying to do is to make it an honest bottom line to get rid of the subsidies that are sending it in the wrong direction. But, but DDG, particularly if you've actually got one that is antibiotic free, is wonderful. It's, it, what you take out of it in the brewery is carbon and hydrogen. What you return to it is the protein that your cows want, and that's good. With regard to China, uh, with I will say this with some degree of awkwardness, but it's, it's simply true. A, a lot of what is sent is milk to China and to other countries, is then mixed with water that is in terrible shape. And so the people, while they get some nutrition, also get a fair amount of disease. I, I think China is moving aggressively toward a high degree of self-sufficiency. But, but. And then finally, um, dairy cows are a relatively small fraction of the American herd, give or take a little bit more than a tenth. When we're talking about the dramatic decrease in cows, those are the most dramatic decrease is going to be in beef cattle. I don't think that the dairy industry is going to be anywhere near that much affected. Thanks. So big hand. Thank you, Gail and Dennis. For Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.